Hi, I'm Jane McCallion. And I'm Adam Shepherd. And you're listening to the IT Pro Podcast. And chances are, you're listening to it not on the train or in your car or at the gym, but from the comfort of your own home. That's right. The country has gone into effective lockdown over the coronavirus. Uh, Most of us are now working from home, uh, aside from our colleagues in the retail and service industries, unfortunately. Uh, And and health. And Uh, health, of course. (laughs) Lest we forget. Yes. Uh, But yes, like most people, uh, we are recording from home where we have been working for just over a week. I haven't seen your setup of your podcast studio, Adam. No, I shall need to uh, share my glorious pod cave, which is basically (laughs) a uh, (laughs) microphone and a blanket. Uh, Well, I have already shared mine on Twitter. You can find me (laughs) at Jane McCallion and see my wonderful uh, baby jail turned into a podcast studio. Hmm. You can find me at Adam Shepherd UK if you're interested in seeing my quarantine cuisine and my glorious podcast setup. <laughs> uh, we haven't quite gone stir crazy from lack of human contact yet, but I'm sure it's coming. Well, it has only been four days. Um, we've managed to uh, really overlook here the uh, reason that everybody is uh, quarantined in their houses, which is, of course, uh, coronavirus, COVID-19. And in related news, it should come as no surprise whatsoever that our top story this week is all about coronavirus. Yes, so uh, the majority of offices, as we say, are working remotely. This is a huge shift for most people. I think even organisations like the one we work for, Dennis Publishing, um, we encourage flexible working and remote working for a very, very long time. But to have hundreds of people out is a huge shift no matter how flexible you are and um, of course this is something that you wrote a column about midweek Adam. Mm, It is indeed Uh, so this is based on uh, advice from the government and uh, the NHS which is that uh, as many people as possible should work from home where able minimize uh, contact with other people to prevent the spread of COVID-19 and it has been as you say a, a really big adjustment Uh, A lot of people weren't quite prepared for this, despite the fact that I warned about six months ago uh, in another column that uh, we would need to prepare for mass remote working. I thought it would be spurred by Brexit and a talent crunch from a lack of EU developers. Uh, But as it turns out, it's a global pandemic. Yes, I think we'll just call you sort of half right Cassandra for, <laughs> from now on shall we um, I, you know, it's also worth without wishing to give ourselves a big old pat on the back either um, there are a couple of podcast episodes which we will leave links to in the show notes about um, can tech survive the corona crisis and perhaps more usefully um, do we still need offices anymore which has some tips on this kind of remote working although no, perhaps at you know, sort of an almost national scale the whole thing, you know, it's not its not just uh, the individuals who are now working from home who are finding this a bit of strange and perhaps a bit of a strain. Uh, Microsoft Teams, which is a well-known, well-used um, collaboration platform, had a two-hour outage on Monday um, and vendors are warning of reduced performance, which is not really very surprising. Mm. I mean, you know, none of these services were built to support this many people using them simultaneously. And lest we forget on a wide variety of, you know, network connections and connection speeds. Um, What's more, you know, we're now seeing an uptick in the use of AI amongst social media platforms. I think, you know, even those of us who were very online with capital letters, which (laughs) I'd include myself in, Mm. um, you know, we're all on you know, social media more than we were before. There's a lot of disinformation around uh, and misinformation. Mm. And so, yeah, the, they're relying more heavily on AI moderation. Well, uh, crucially, presumably also because some of their um, colleagues will be falling ill. Well, it's not that so much as the fact that a lot of the moderation staff 
cannot work from home for data privacy reasons. A lot of the a lot of the oh, stuff of they're dealing with can only be done within the you know specific confines of an office environment. So they're having to use AI moderation tools to plug the gaps, which is why you may have noticed that a lot more posts are getting flagged on social oh, media. Oh yes, there was than a big normally. snafu earlier in the week. Did you mm. see that? That everything I from did. the BBC was being flagged. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Yes. Um, but you know, this uh, level of uh, collaboration, not just in terms of collaboration platforms, but um, organisations and companies banding together. You know, telcos are offering free data services. Some um, um, software as a service vendors are offering free tools uh, to support remote working, but. Given that this is likely to be something that carries on for months rather than weeks, you know, in China it's been what the lockdown lasted sort of three months ish. Mm. Um, I, I don't know how sustainable this is going to be. Well, it's going to have to be. I mean, the advice from uh, the UK's chief medical officer is that mm. this is going to be a period of months rather than weeks, and that we should, uh, as you say, kind of prepare for the long haul. Uh, so it honestly, with my somewhat pessimistic hat on, I can't see this clearing up before summer. Yeah, I think you're right. But I mean, more can vendors continue giving stuff away free? You know, it it's very good of them. And, you know, to be slightly more cynical, it's good PR to give away um, services right mm. now. But if this goes on for three months, is that really a sustainable business situation? No. And, you know, presumably the end goal for the companies offering various free services is that once this all blows over, they will convert into paying customers. Uh, but as you say, if this goes on for, you know, six months or more, uh, I can't see these services being free forever. No. In other news, completely unrelated news, but perhaps still not particularly upbeat, uh, Carphone Warehouse is closing down all its uh, standalone high street stores. Yeah. At the start of next month, high street institution Carphone Warehouse will be shutting uh, all of its remaining 532 uh, standalone branches. Uh, as of the 3rd of April, uh, 2,900 staff who worked there will be facing redundancy. This doesn't include the 305 sub-branches of smaller Carphone Warehouse stores located inside the larger Curry's PC World superstores, uh, which will remain uh, unaffected. Yes. Um, you know, it, it's no secret, really, that the company has been struggling uh, for the past few years. Consumer habits have been changing. Uh, you, one of its, or some of its notable competitors, for example, Phones for You, uh, disappeared from the high street uh, oh, some God. years ago. I forgot about phones for you. That's a blast from the past. <laughs> yeah, it's you know I I was surprised when this news came out actually that most of the um, stores are standalone ones uh, versus the in branch ones. You know, this kind of it's not not quite double um, standalone versus in branch um, inside Curry's PC World. But I did, yeah, I found that kind of surprising uh, until it was pointed out to me that in the town where I live, there is actually two standalone stores <laughs> in addition to the ones that are inside Curry's PC World. Uh, you know, not only has this been a problem with, you know, in terms of uh, consumers' habits changing, um, it was also whacked with a £500,000 fine in January over a 2017 data breach. So that's got to smart a little bit as well. And, you know, I'm not saying that that's necessarily the reason, but it well, possibly it kind of helped. helped it. Yeah, I was going to say, get, give a little old nudge off this mortal coil. Yeah, the the company has been struggling for a while, not just Carphone Warehouse, but uh, parent company Dixon's Carphone has been uh, in not particularly great financial straits as relates to its mobile division uh, for a while now. It's cited... Uh, consumer unwillingness to sign up for two-year contracts as well as changes in how people buy and use devices you know more people shopping online through sites like amazon that kind of thing um however it's not entirely grim for the almost three thousand staff who are uh, facing losing their jobs the company has said it will 
try and offer as many people as possible uh, alternative jobs within the company. And for those that it can't, it will pay enhanced redundancy. It'll pay out any bonuses owed to them. Uh, it will honor share awards and it'll even help them find new jobs via an outplacement program, which is, you know, encouraging and uh, a good move. Yeah, I, I was going to say it's, um, you know, obviously for, for those people who are losing their jobs, there's there's no way that of this being construed as good news no. you know, at all unless they're about to walk out the door and then have been handed redundancy in which well, case for those you know sort of like a couple of people you good on you mm -hmm. but, um, <laughs> yeah but generally speaking you know this is going to be awful and especially you know in the situation we find ourselves in now yeah i mean COVID, it is not a not a good time for this news it, to be coming it can down come at a worse time but, but at the very least that, they're not being whole... thrown completely to the wolves yeah, I was going to say this. This package is is pretty good. So, but yes, our thoughts, I guess, with the with the people who are about to lose their jobs. Finally, Microsoft is further cementing its developer credentials with the news that it will be acquiring npm and merging it with GitHub. Yes, so the npm package manager is a key part of the JavaScript ecosystem and hosts one point three million packages. Um, it's going to be integrated with GitHub, but will remain open source, which is a bit of a trend that we've got going on at the moment, do you think? It is indeed. Uh, there was a lot of scepticism uh, around Microsoft's kind of trend in recent years towards cozying up to the open source and developer communities. You know, Microsoft, historically not the biggest friend to the open source community or to developers in general, quite frankly. Um, but... I think its recent actions, particularly uh, with the acquisition of GitHub and its subsequent management of the platform, uh, have actually shown that it's really quite willing and capable to support and further the open source community. Yeah, well, to the extent that I actually forgot until this story came up that um, Microsoft owns GitHub at mm. all. Um, yeah, the bit about it being integrated with GitHub, I was like, wait, what? And then, yeah, remembered that that was a thing that happened. So I think that kind of speaks to its independence. It does remind me a little bit, to be honest with you, of uh, IBM's acquisition of Red Hat. Yeah, and very much they were also very much promised and have followed through on that promise to keep uh, all the Red Hat kit our, um, open source. So... Yeah, maybe it's a it's a wider trend that we're going to see less slowly, maybe a bit more steadily going forward. Hmm. We're going to take a short break now, but once we come back, we'll be talking to Mark Powell, CTO of insurance platform TempCover. See you after the break. Welcome back. We're now joined by TempCover's Mark Pell, who was responsible for redesigning the company's platform from the ground up. Six years on, he's now in charge of the company's entire technology stack. Mark, welcome to the show. Hi, how are you doing? So, could you start off by telling us a little bit about your background? Yeah, of course. So, as you said, I'm Chief Technical Officer at TempCover. Uh, I've got a Master's degree in Computer Science and been working in the field for about 15 years now. Uh, probably started when uh, my parents bought our first family PC and uh, after um, a, a little bit of a misstep and essentially uh, breaking it, I uh, managed to fix it before they'd realised and kind of got the bug at that point really. <laughs> um, I come from a background of software development um, in terms of, of tech and IT, so um, I've built systems in the past for publications, conference attendance. Um, a few multinational HR and performance management systems, and obviously now uh, my first step into the insurance market. Very nice. So you were responsible for essentially redesigning, uh, as Jane mentioned, TempCover's entire technology platform. Could you tell us a little bit about what that was like? Yeah, of course. Um, it was made uh, clear to me when I was uh, being interviewed for the, for the role that there was a need to kind of modernize the platform. So uh, the first six months were really kind of understanding the insurance market. And, and in our case, the kind of niche that we work inside of, obviously, we're not selling uh, yearly insurance. We're selling insurance from as little as an hour at the moment. So that's quite different to the market generally. Um, and that then kind of moved into me uh, having a play with uh, the platform 
just on my sofa at home really to build a proof of concept uh, that that lasted a few weeks and I kind of took that proof of concept into work and, and made the suggestion that this is how we should pivot and uh, I'm really proud to say that, that that platform that proof of concept has now sold uh, in excess of 1.5 million motor insurance policies which is which is pretty great um, obviously that comes with some some hazards uh, you, know, you can imagine that was my baby that software to start with um, but naturally I've had to kind of release the reins a little bit and uh, the rest of the business hiring good people and so on they've kind of taken that on and run with it now. So tell us a little bit more about the new platform uh, that you designed uh, what's what does the technical side of it look like what makes it different from uh, temp covers previous platform and for other platforms in the industry sure so um what makes it different from other platforms in the industry uh, generally speaking the insurance industry works off of a range of quite uh, dated like potentially even multi decades old systems that you would buy into uh, to work on that more traditional yearly uh, insurance model we, we obviously want to work in more of a niche, more of a kind of insure tech uh, space and, and working in policies that could be as little as an hour. Uh, the system's actually built so we could even write a policy of a millisecond or more. Um, so to do that, we had to write our own, our own system, our own platform, rather than buy into these, uh, these kind of existing systems that frankly just can't support that. Um, that comes with some positives and some negatives, obviously. Uh, means we have complete control over what we build and we can kind of pivot and, and react quickly. Uh, likewise, it means we don't get the kind of uh, off-the-shelf nature of some of these systems that, that our competitors who work in the more traditional insurance space have. Uh, in terms of the, the system itself and, and how it's unique, I guess, um, given that we've written it from the ground up uh, from that proof of concept that I mentioned earlier, it's, uh, it's completely bespoke um, and it means we have full control over which bits we're happy with, which bits we want to change uh, and evolve as the market changes. That must give you a, um, a good degree of flexibility, but there must be some challenges associated uh, with that and using that approach to go up against some of the biggest and most established insurance providers. Yeah, um, I mean, personally, I actually think that those, those challenges are, are kind of um, what help us and set us apart from the more established uh, insurance providers. Um, the insurance market especially is, is kind of ripe for digital disruption. It's quite overdue, really, I, I believe. Uh, and one of our strengths is, is solving those technical challenges. So we do this by working in a kind of fast-paced, agile and flexible way, um, both in how we work, but also the product we sell, obviously, um, neither of which um, are completely traditional. Uh, and that allows us to, to kind of offer that that product that we feel is probably a better fit and more flexible for consumers. There's obviously a lot of people that want to buy a yearly policy for their car or their van or their motorbike and, and continue to do so. But there's also an awful lot of use cases of people who are just looking to borrow a car for a short period of time or a van if they're moving house and so on. So tell us a little bit more about Temp Cover's technical infrastructure. Uh, I'm guessing as a kind of fairly new build and as a kind of relatively digital native company you guys are going quite heavily on the cloud side of things that's correct yes so we've um we've, we've kind of recently made the public facing side of our systems uh fully integrated into microsoft's azure platform and we chose that because our developers actually are, are kind of microsoft stack driven um generally speaking not not exclusively but um and we felt it was a good fit for that reason um, we, we, we obviously enjoy the, the kind of um, lack of need to kind of maintain the hardware that comes with the cloud side of things. Um, but then with the infrastructure of the rest of the business as well, for, for a long time, we've been driving our, our kind of operational side of the business through cloud-based systems, whether that be um, Azure DevOps, uh, which was VSTS for the kind of project management side of building the software uh, and, and so on. And also tools like monday.com for high level project management, um, Octopus Cloud for deployments. So all these kind of cloud, cloud tools uh, allow us to kind of operate on a daily basis without the need for kind of maintaining on-premises systems that obviously drag us away from the things that really set us apart. So, Mark, uh, I don't think we spoke about it at the top in the news section, and, you know, and even if somebody slept through that, it's inescapable that we're in a very odd current situation and will be for a while. Is that going to be a challenge for you guys, do you think, from an operational standpoint, even though you're very cloud-based? Yeah, I mean, yeah, um, obviously it's going to be challenging times um, for most people in one way or another. Um, 
Thankfully, we've embraced cloud services for infrastructure for a while. Um, our staff collaborate in cloud-based tools like Microsoft Teams, so we're pretty well set up to maintain business as usual from an operational perspective. Uh, we asked the entire office to work from home two days last week, actually, and it worked really well. It was a good tester. Uh, we've all been working from home for the past few days, and thankfully, everyone continues to work without any real problems. Um, as I mentioned, we host our public-facing uh, side of the business in Microsoft Azure, so we don't expect there to be any requirement for changes there. Uh, and obviously the, the kind of infrastructure side of things is in, in cloud-based tools as well. So the actual transition of people working from home has been relatively um, relatively kind of trouble-free, which is which I'm very thankful for. Uh, I, I hope and expect that to continue, but hopefully not for too long for all of our sakes, obviously. <laughs> well, quite. Um, yeah. I am slightly gratified uh, to hear that you went with Microsoft based on your pre-existing familiarity with the Microsoft stack, uh, because as regular listeners will know, this is uh, something of a hobby horse uh, of mine. <laughs> uh, the idea, sure is. Yeah, uh, the idea that the vast majority of enterprise customers will naturally gravitate to Azure rather than to AWS because you know because of the existing relationships with Microsoft and uh, the existing kind of familiarity with the tool set uh, but in terms of your kind of cloud infrastructure and cloud development what's the next step for you guys in terms of technologies and areas that you'd like to expand into Sure. So we uh, we don't have a kind of monolith application, but neither are we microservices. Uh, we like to try and draw a bit of a pragmatic approach to, to to making that decision. I think there's always more you can do to try and separate concerns in inside of the the software and operationally as well to make sure that at any one time, uh, if something did go wrong, you just got one small part to try and rectify. So we can always continue to improve in that area, I would say. Um, and then likewise, as mentioned earlier, we're we're all about being innovative. So trying to lean on some of the more innovative aspects and features that are available to us in the cloud at the moment uh, I would say we have explored some OCR with driving license scanning uh, we are looking into uh, obviously machine learning with all of the wealth of data that we've got relating to policies that are bought and claims um, there's there's untold things we can do in that side of things I imagine so yeah that will be our next steps well that's all we have time for this week thank you once again Mark for joining us you can find links to all of the topics we've spoken about today in the show notes and even more on our website, www.itpro.co.uk. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn, or you can sign up to the IT Pro newsletter for a daily dose of IT news in your inbox. Alternatively, you can contact us via email at podcast at itpro.co.uk. Don't forget to subscribe to the IT Pro podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher or wherever else you find podcasts to never miss an episode. Please also leave us a rating and review because that really helps us get visibility and for your fellow IT professionals to find us. We'll be back next week with more news and analysis from the world of IT. Until then, goodbye. Bye. The IT Pro Podcast is brought to you by the Dennis Podcast Network.